<sighs> well, today sucks. First, the A's come into Sacramento. Yes, to me, that's a bad thing. To the Kings, blowing a 21-point lead to the New York Knicks. There was even an earthquake here in Sacramento in the middle of tonight's Kings game. So many times after losses, I make it an offense versus defense thing. Tonight, they both sucked, especially when it mattered. And we'll break it all down right here on Locked on Kings. You are Locked on Kings, your daily Sacramento Kings podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it is that time. Time for another episode of Locked On Kings. Hello and welcome into Locked On Kings, your podcast hub for Sacramento Kings coverage all season long. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. My name is Matt George. I have the privilege of being your host here. I'm a Sacramento sports anchor and reporter for ABC Ten News. And it's been a long day. It started with what actually many of you might think is a really, really big positive for the city of Sacramento. And depending upon your perspective, you could be right. There really is no right or wrong in this case. Sacramento is getting the A's. MLB baseball is coming to Sacramento for at least three years. That news broke this morning. I've been at work at ABC 10 all day long from 8.30 this morning. I covered the press conferences earlier at Sutter Health Park. But I'm not happy about it. I'm not happy because of my Oakland A's fandom, my my background growing up in the Coliseum in Oakland. That's something that I'm going to actually take some time and talk about a lot at the end of this podcast. So if you're interested in my opinions and thoughts on that and everything, my perspective on everything that's going on there, stay tuned to the end of the episode. Obviously, this is the Locked on Kings podcast. We're here to talk about Kings basketball and the Kings falling apart. In the Big Apple tonight, inside Madison Square Garden, blowing a 21-point lead, man. I don't even know where to begin with this. A lot of people, hey, I mean, I've had a frustrating day. I feel like punching someone. So it feels like, uh, or it seems like all the fighting analogies that that Kings fans and media members are using tonight when to describe this basketball game, that's fitting. The Kings came out of the gate, and they threw a haymaker, and they connected right on the chin of the New York Knicks, staggered them for a 30 30- uh, or, or a 21-point lead early in this game. They outscored uh, New York, I think, like 34-20 to 20 in the first quarter. I didn't write it down for some reason because my brain's not working today. But the Kings built a 21-point lead early on, came out of the gate red hot, shooting from three-point range, 7 of 10 in the first quarter. Defense was on point. It was superb. It was engaged and active. Kings looked like they were ready to play, ready to step up in, t- in a big game considering who they're playing tomorrow, and we'll get into that later as well. Not to mention, of course, every game is big from here on out with the standing situation in the Western Conference playoff race. And then everything fell apart, right? So the the Kings connect on this big haymaker, and then the, the Knicks give them body shot after body shot after body shot over the course of the second and third quarters with a 32-point second quarter, followed by a 35-point third quarter. And then we get to the fourth quarter where the Knicks, led by Jalen Brunson and Josh Hart, throw the KO punch. The Kings, on the ropes, have absolutely no answer. Kings are outscored 33-22 to in the fourth quarter to close this game out. 21-point leads need to mean more than what it feels like they mean when the Sacramento Kings have them. Right, I, I, I know the Kings' record is actually really solid when they have more than a 15-point lead at, at any point during the game, and that's good. But even in those games where the Kings are winning, they're not maintaining these leads as well as they should. And in, in, like in my opinion, my perspective, I don't know if it's the Kings taking their foot off the gas or the confidence that other teams have in knowing that the Kings. Will will probably let them back in, or there's so much time left. A 21 point lead in the first quarter early on in this game uh, doesn't mean nearly as much as if it was a 21 point lead in the second half. But a consistent theme of this Kings team this year, amongst many, has been their inability to stop big runs by opposing teams. It's not a 10 to two run or an eight to two run or a 12 to four run. It's like 18 two. 16-4, 20-4, right? These long periods where the Kings are outscored. It was a 16-2 run that happened in the second quarter 
to bring the Knicks all the way back from down 21 to I think they got within like nine or eight points in the second quarter. And then, of course, they dominated this second half completely. There's a very, very fine line in today's NBA between blowing leads and, well, that lead just isn't what it used to be, right? With scoring at a premium and 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 three-point shooting and shooting early in the shot clock and whatever you want to say, like the modern NBA, a, a, a double-digit lead, a 15-point lead just isn't what it used to be, right? But I feel like the Kings are constantly, or at least consistently, dancing on that fine line of, hey, we have a big lead and it's uh, we're blowing it, or, hey, we have a big lead, but there's still still a lot of time left and in and, and, and modern NBA and scoring, like that lead maybe isn't as big as it looks on the scoreboard or as, as we thought it was. But again, a 21-point lead, especially in a game where there's so much on the line, like tonight and like every game from here on out, a 21-point lead has to mean more than that. The Kings have to do a better job protecting that. And it's not just so much that the Kings lose a 21-point lead and end up losing by double digits, 120 to 109. It's not just the swing. It's the fact that the way the Kings look in one quarter and then the way they look for the rest of the game, it's Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. And credit to the New York Knicks, the adjustments they made. There, This game was on TNT, so there was a point in the first quarter when the Kings were up big that they played audio of Tom Thibodeau during the timeout, and Coach Thibodeau said, hey, the offense will come, establish yourselves on the defensive end, right? That's what the Knicks did. They built some confidence on defense. The Kings started missing some shots. They got back the other way. The Kings, for some reason, could not stop Josh Hart tonight. Jalen Brunson did his thing, of course, and then suddenly... The Kings' lead is gone, and then suddenly the Knicks have all the momentum, and then suddenly the Knicks win this game by double digits, right? Like, I don't know if it's... I mean, it's a, it's a combination of a bunch of things, but Mike Brown did not do a good enough job making adjustments over the course of this game. The Kings stuck too long with what was working earlier and not working for the remainder of the game. They were too stubborn, or the game plan was all wrong and off completely. Like, I don't... I can't tell you what any specific or one specific thing was the reason why the Kings lost tonight because I don't think that exists, right? So much, so many times this season I've talked about the offense let the Kings down or the defense let the Kings down. It's one or the other. It's one versus the other, right? The offense can be really good on a night that the defense isn't good enough or the, the, the defense is really good on the night that the offense lets the Kings down. For so much a, a time this season on Locked on Kings, After wins and losses, I've talked about one versus the other. No need to do that tonight because with the exception of the first quarter, the offense and the defense both sucked. Let's start with the offense. After going 7 of 10 from three-point range in the first quarter, the Kings shot 11 of 32 from three for the rest of the game. That includes four of 14 in the fourth quarter. So not only did the Kings shoot their poorest three-point percentage in a quarter in the fourth quarter when the game was on the line, this continues to live up to this Kings live or die by the three-point shot. And I understand, I know that Mike Brown wants to generate spray threes. Of course, a typical box score does not track spray threes. Mike has an assistant coach do that. And obviously, I'm not in New York City, so I can't ask Mike what the spray three numbers were tonight. I know that he wants to generate 20 spray three-point attempts per game. But the Kings shot 42 of them tonight. And going 11 of 32 in the second half, like, this team on paper, is supposed to be a better three-point shooting team. Even with Malik Monk and Kevin Herter healthy, this team is supposed to be one of the best three-point shooting teams in the league, or at the very least, loaded with three-point talent. Far too many times this season, the Kings have died by the three-point shot. And of course, that leads to points in the paint. Outscored 60-40 to in the paint by the New York Knicks. That's a blowout in the paint. Kings only took 30 shots in the paint tonight. Out of 86... One, again, that shows they're too reliant on the three-point the, uh, the three shot. Two, credit to New York Knicks defense. They know to, to, to muddy up the paint and swarm the paint and make life difficult for the Kings around the rim. Every team knows that at this point because every team's trying to do it against Sacramento. The Knicks just happened to do it very, very well. When the Kings did get in the paint, though, they shot 66%, 20 of 30. So when they did get inside, good things happened. They just didn't get inside enough. This team is too reliant on the three-point shot at times. And with the exception of De'Aaron Fox, who was 
really the only one hitting three-pointers all game long. The fourth quarter, he kind of struggled. Sacramento just was famine instead of feast for far too long, and that's the reason why this game swung the way it did. Not to mention the Kings turned the ball over 16 times, leading to 26 points for the New York Knicks. You're not hitting shots. You're doing a piss-poor job of taking care of the basketball on the road against a good team who came into this game, I think, on a three-game losing streak. So even though they're banged up, they were pissed off because they're in a big playoff race for positioning in the Eastern Conference. The Kings dropped the ball, right? That's on the offensive side. Now let's talk about the defense, too, because, of course, Jalen Brunson did his thing, right? 35 points. I expect that from Jalen Brunson. There's not a player on the Sacramento Kings that can stop him. Keon Ellis had his second crack at Jalen Brunson and got beat down again. Ellis Island might have a few victims on it, but if Keon Ellis is trying to put Jalen Brunson on Ellis Island, Jalen has a speedboat and is able to get off with ease, right? Jalen, Keon Ellis, the Kings, they can't do anything to stop Jalen Brunson. Now, they're not alone in that because Jalen Brunson has torched a lot of teams, if not every single team at some point this season. He's been absolutely phenomenal this year. But I expected the Kings to get beat by Jalen Brunson. He scored 35. What I didn't expect and what isn't acceptable at all is for Josh Hart to have a season-high 31 points tonight on 14 of 19 shooting from the field. Not only is that shooting percentage ridiculous, he didn't shoot a single three-pointer because Josh Hart doesn't shoot threes. You gave up 31 points to a guy that didn't shoot a single three-pointer. That's not a hot night. That is you doing a piss-poor job on the defensive end of the floor. That is you not adjusting not fixing an obvious problem all game long. Like, Josh Hart carved up Sacramento tonight. Again, with the exception of the first quarter where nobody on the Knicks did well because Kings Sacramento's defense was really, really good. For the second through fourth quarters, Josh Hart got whatever the heck he wanted. Again, I get getting beat by Jalen Brunson, but you getting beat by Josh Hart for 31 points without a single three-point attempt? Not, a, not just a single without a single made three, a single three-point attempt, and you got carved up for 31 points. That can't happen. But don't worry, the three-point attempts came from Dante DiVincenzo, who I guess finally had one of his revenge games against the Sacramento Kings. 21 points on five of nine from three-point shooting from Dante DiVincenzo. Like, the Kings got carved up from multiple different players on a night where they've been missing Julius Randle. The Knicks beat the Kings twice without Julius Randle already. No OG Ananobi for the New York Knicks. And still, the Kings got carved up by other guys. And on top of that, the thing that frustrated me the most with the Kings' defense, I don't know what the hell the deal is with these slow, lazy, blitz double teams well outside of the three-point line. They tried to do it against Jalen Brunson. They even tried to do it against Josh Hart a couple times, but mainly it was against Jalen Brunson. It never worked. And I don't know... If it doesn't work because the Kings, like I said, are too lazy to actually aggressively blitz, close out, attack the ball, and not just slowly kind of float over like they do basically every single time. So I don't know if it was just because they were lazy and not giving their all on the blitz and close out, or if they simply don't know what the hell they're doing. And that's what I feel like it is more than laziness. When these when the Kings choose to blitz double team, it doesn't look like they know what they're supposed to do. Because it's way too slow, it's way too easy for for Brunson or whoever it is, because the Kings have done this against multiple teams this season and it's almost never worked. It's way too easy to pass out of it, and then it's a four on three on the other other end of the court or inside the three-point line because this three-point blitz is happening well outside the three-point line. So you're giving way too much space for essentially a four on three and feels like every single time it resulted in a shot in the rim or, or a shot in the paint. For the Knicks, which they converted. It's not working. I don't know if that's on Jordy Fernandez, who's supposedly in charge of the defense. I don't know if that's in charge of uh, on Mike Brown, on the players. Whoever the hell it is, figure it out because it doesn't work. And we're all watching it going, stop doing it. Right? It's it's too easy to beat. Like if if you're going to blitz, blitz. Go all in. It's a risk anyway. You're leaving your man to help guard one guy. Commit fully to it or don't do it at all. And when the Kings do this kind of 50-50, okay, I guess we'll kind of float over and put our hands up and try and cut off the passing lane, Brunson passes out of it, and then the Kings are on the back foot and they fall apart. It just, 
terrible defensive execution, terrible offensive execution, terrible shot making. I haven't even talked about individual performances. I'm gonna I, I gotta talk about Harrison Barnes tonight. Did you notice that he played basketball tonight? He actually did. He played 15 minutes, but if you didn't notice him, I wouldn't be surprised by that. We'll talk about Harrison Barnes. We'll talk about De'Aaron Fox. He had a, a a great night for the most part. Didn't get enough help. On top of that, once again got outplayed by Jalen Brunson. We'll discuss that all as well, plus my feelings on the A's moving to Sacramento. That's all still to come here on Locked on Kings. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by BetterHelp. Sometimes we all need the opportunity to get something off of our chest. Whether it's big or small, certain things can really start to get to you. It's important to let that out, especially someone uh, or to someone who's unbiased on your life. Today I want to tell you how I feel about BetterHelp, specifically how I feel about mental health and therapy, something I've been doing and I've been seeing my therapist TJ since uh, COVID. And it's helped me unpack a lot of different things in my life that I thought were small. I thought didn't really matter. I thought weren't worth seeing a therapist and and seeking attention. And I think a lot of us are like that. Now, those of us out there who are dealing with extreme issues and and, and problems and things that you really need to seek help for, I always encourage you uh, to go out and see a therapist. I'm not trying to diminish anything that you're, you're going through whatsoever. I'm saying therapy is important for the majority of us who have these little issues and this baggage that we're carrying in life that we don't realize is actually a bigger issue than what we think. And we all fall into the trap of, hey, I, I just don't think this issue is big enough or important enough or significant enough for therapy. I don't need therapy for this. This is something I'll just carry on with me. I'll figure it out on my own, right? That's dangerous because that can build upon itself and make it worse and worse. And before you know it, it turns into an extreme issue. Uh, and and now you're you're really in deep trouble, right? So go and see a therapist for whatever you might be dealing with. Frustrations, uh, family life, work life, just things from your childhood, whatever it may be, go and seek a therapist. And if you're considering giving therapy a try, consider BetterHelp. BetterHelp is a, uh, it gets you connected with a network of therapists all online that works around your schedule. Go to betterhelp.com slash locked on NBA to get 10% off your first month. That's betterhelp, H-E-L. LP.com slash locked on NBA. I've really enjoyed over the last, let's say, couple of months, really, it feels like since 2024 started, I've really enjoyed not talking about Harrison Barnes' disappearing acts. That doesn't mean he hasn't had bad games in 2024, but compared to the first half of the season when there were far too many instances of Harrison playing. 15, 20 minutes and scoring two points and taking like two or three shots and us all looking around going, I didn't even notice number 40 was on the floor. We hadn't had that for a while. Unfortunately, we had that tonight. Harrison Barnes in 15 minutes, zero points. 0 of 2 shooting from the field. One rebound, one steal, three turnovers. Harrison Barnes didn't do anything. He did nothing. Nothing. A complete disappearing act that at this point in time, the Sacramento Kings simply cannot survive with. Kevin Herter's out. Malik Monk is out. Two guys, two volume shooters, volume scorers. Sacramento needs Harrison Barnes to give them something. Now again, more often than not recently, Harrison has been giving them something. But this disappearing act tonight absolutely cannot happen. Harrison got carved the hell up on both ends of the ball. He really, really struggled tonight. And to give you some perspective to what the rest of the team did, 18 points, 17 points, 11 points, 29 points, 11 points, 10 points, 11 points. With the exception of Alex Len, who scored two points, and Harrison Barnes, who scored zero points, Every other king that didn't play essentially in garbage time when Mike emptied his bench at the end of the game scored double digits. Now, it's not too often that you're going to get seven guys scoring in double figures. More often than not, if you're getting seven guys scoring in double figures, you probably should be winning that basketball game. Now, unfortunately, most of these double figures were just barely. Like I said, three players scored 11 points, one player scored 10. But if, if Harrison Barnes just scores 10 points, which is not something absurd to ask Harrison on a nightly basis. If he just scores 10 points, the Kings win this game. I know it's not an exact 
one-to-one science, right? You can't just say, oh, Harrison Barnes scores 10 points and the Kings win 119. Sorry, if the, if the Kings, if, if Harrison Barnes scores 10 points, excuse me, the, the Kings don't win. They're within one point and it's a significantly closer game down the stretch. And, and my math is terrible. Again, my brain is fried. So my point is, the Kings get double digits from Harrison Barnes. This game is significant, significantly closer. And who knows what happens at that point in time, right? You need, you, you got to get something from HB every single night. You got to get something from everybody every single night at this point, not just because you're dealing with the injuries, but because of the significance of all these games. Just a brutal, brutal time for Harrison not to show up. Then you have De'Aaron Fox tonight. 29 points, 11 of 26 from the field, 6 of 13 from three-point range, 7 rebounds, 7 assists, 3 steals, 1 block. Take that stat line as a whole, it's really hard to find anything wrong with it. I thought there were times where De'Aaron Fox was playing like the absolute superstar the Kings needed him to be. He had 16 points early on in this game. Unfortunately, that means he only had 13 points for the remainder of the game, so he cooled off and slowed down a little bit. Again, credit to the New York Knicks for adjusting and, and, and playing uh, better on him and picking him up more uh, on the defensive end. I have a hard time, like I have a hard time saying the Kings needed more from De'Aaron Fox tonight. Now maybe they need him to score thirty points, but I mean he scored twenty nine and they lost by eleven. So if he gets into the thirties, do we really feel better? Now unfortunately, the fourth quarter scoring was not good enough. He went two of nine from the field, only five points. In the fourth quarter, we know how much the Kings last season and this season rely on crunch time clutch Fox, especially without Malik Monk out there to help him. Fox wasn't good enough in the fourth quarter offensively. The Kings needed him to virtually carry them, even with six other guys scoring in double figures. It did not matter. Fox was the only guy that was going to offensively lead Sacramento to this win. I thought Keegan Murray, I think he finished with 18 points. Keegan Murray had good moments in this game as well. Uh, DeMondis Sabonis also had 17 points. I could say, man, Sabonis, you need to be in those 20s, especially in big games. So there's there's little nitpicky things that I can do and say about different players in the box score tonight outside, of course, of Harrison Barnes. But overall, offensively, I'm not going to say the Kings did enough offensively to win, but one of the things that Mike Brown has been talking a lot about is the Kings need to f- find ways to consistently win when they're scoring around 110 points. And it's defensively where they're going to need to make that happen more often than not. But if that's not the way the game is going, right? If things are unraveling in the fourth quarter the way that they are. I mean, the Knicks scored 30 or more points in the second, third, and fourth quarter. So defensively, you knew you were kind of shot. The Knicks were figuring things out. Josh Hart was scoring at will. The Knicks were scoring in the paint at will. Offensively, you knew that you need to punch back, right? You need to counter punch. And Fox didn't do enough there. Sabonis didn't do enough there. The Kings offense, in general, had a good night. But good is not good enough at this point in time. And that's kind of a theme with this Kings team as a whole, right? Important perspective here. Over the last 15 games, the Kings are 9-6. and six. It's not bad. It's fine, right? It's it's fine to even good. But at this point in time, good is not good enough. With the Western Conference race the way it is, call it unfair, call it unrealistic, like it's not good enough for the Kings to get to where they want to go. Now, part of me wants to go, Matt, this is just who this team is, right? This is what they've shown you all season long. Losing games like this is going to put them in the play-in picture. And that's probably where this team deserves to be. And that probably is the case. That probably is the truth. But what the Kings say they're trying to do, the standard that they're trying to hold themselves to, Mike Brown included, this just being good 9-6 and six over the last 15 games when a lot of those six losses were against teams that are directly... Uh, impacting you in the standings, good is not good enough. The Kings are still in eighth place. They're now a full game back of the Pelicans and the Suns. The Suns are in six. The Pelicans are in seven. Remember, the Kings do not even come close to owning the tiebreaker with the Pelicans, so they have to outright 
pass the Pelicans in the standings if they want to finish higher than them. So really, even though they're a game back of the Pelicans, it basically they're at least a game and a half back of the Pelicans, and that's if that makes sense. And the Phoenix Suns, who the Kings are even with. They have a tiebreaker game coming up here, a fifth game between the two in Sacramento coming up a little bit later on. But those teams are where the Kings want to be. The Kings are holding on to the eighth play uh, playoff spot or play-in spot, eighth seed in the West, which is, in my opinion, like the absolute worst that they should be okay with doing or finishing. But you got the Los Angeles Lakers now that are half a game behind you. The Lakers in the ninth seed, half a game back. Now, the Lakers are in a similar situation to the Kings because the Lakers don't own the tiebreaker against the Kings because the Kings swept them. So the Lakers have to actually pass Sacramento. So they have a little more cushion than it feels like. That being said, I already think that the play-in is is terrifying for the Sacramento Kings. They can't, can't finish 9th or 10th because the difference between 9 and 10 and 8 and 7 is astronomical. Because 8-7, and seven, you only have to win once to get in. Just one game, you're in the playoffs. 9-10, and 10, you have to win both your games just to get the 8th seed. The reality of the Kings falling to 9th, maybe even 10th, is still very much alive. And don't worry, because guess who the Kings play tomorrow? The best team in the NBA, the Boston Celtics. And I know the Celtics are shorthanded right now, that doesn't matter to me. That shouldn't matter to anybody in Sacramento based on how we know this Kings team plays against shorthanded teams. Not to mention the Celtics, they're a well-oiled machine. They know how to win even shorthanded. So the Kings, second night of a back-to-back, about as big of a schedule loss as you could possibly get. Maybe they shock us. Maybe they surprise us and find a way to win in Boston. Feels like they kind of have to at this point because they're good. But good isn't good enough. Or good is good enough to be a play-in team. And potentially good is only good enough to be a 9 or 10 seed. Feels like disaster from the Kings' perspective for me. All right, this is where we're concluding Kings Talk. So if you're just a Sacramento Kings fan, just here for Kings Talk, you can check out now. But I encourage you to stick around because I have some things that I want to say about the A's coming to Sacramento, and that'll come up here in just a second. Today's episode of the Locked on Kings podcast is brought to you by GameTime. GameTime is now an authorized ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, which makes getting tickets even easier and faster. Prices on the GameTime app actually go down the closer it gets to first pitch. I've experienced this with Major League Baseball firsthand during the playoffs last year when I was in San Francisco. My wife and I decided to get last-minute tickets to go and see a Giants game at Oracle Park. We got an incredible discount because we bought tickets literally 45 minutes before the game started. We ended up sitting like 15 rows up behind the Giants bullpen for like 60% less than what the tickets were initially going for. Their last minute flash deals simply cannot be beat. You can save up to 50 or 60% off buying last minute tickets for sports, concerts, comedy theater events, etc. Save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game. They also have zone deals, which means you can save even more or when you choose a section and let game time choose the seats for you. You can get panoramic views from your seats in the app. That's especially helpful for big stadium events like a football game or a, maybe a massive concert so you know exactly what your view is going to be. And it's covered by game time ticket coverage. Your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. So go and take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time, download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Again, that's code Locked On NBA for twenty dollars off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. So I'm fully aware that the vast majority of the people listening to this podcast are Sacramento Kings fans and from Sacramento themselves. Now, until today. Sacramento has never had an MLB team, so most of us here in Sacramento either choose to support the Oakland A's or the San Francisco Giants, or maybe other teams beyond that, but I would say the majority of Sacramentans are probably more San Francisco Giants fans than they are A's fans. 
I am an A's fan. Grew up an A's fan. Grew up going to the Coliseum. My grandma took me when I was a kid. So I am very deeply ingrained in the green and gold, right? I love the Coliseum, and I know how run down it is and ugly it is and, and crappy it is. I love the Coliseum. It's a second home for me, just like Arco Arena was here in Sacramento. To me, the A's forever and only belong in Oakland. Now, if you have followed me on social media or maybe you listen to ESPN 1320 radio when I do weekly hits with uh, D'Lo and KC over there, you know how I feel about A's ownership, John Fisher specifically. For those of you who don't know, I cannot stand the man. I think he's a con artist. I think he's the worst owner in all of sports. I think he has completely mistreated Oakland. I think he has especially mistreated Oakland A's fans long before this relocation saga started. He's he's a god-awful owner that MLB Commissioner Rob Manfred, who is also a fraud, and the MLB and MLB owners have enabled and made his path to Las Vegas and out of Oakland as easy as possible when he absolutely does not deserve it and he rubs it in their face by pocketing their ticket, sh- uh, their revenue share every single year, spending very little money on his product and putting out one of the worst baseball teams, not just this season, not just in recent memory, literally in MLB history. I do not like this man. I want nothing to do with this man. Sacramento is now a part of this man. Sacramento is a part of Fisher breaking the hearts of Oakland and Oakland A's fans. Now, I don't need to go too deep in the weeds on this because, to be honest with you, I'm exhausted. I've been an emotional wreck over the last 48 hours. I've been extremely angry, and now I'm just sad. Now I'm just heartbroken because even though my favorite baseball team is coming to my city to play, you'd think I'd be thrilled about that. They're going to be 20 minutes down the road instead of an hour and 45. I should be thrilled about that. And believe me, sometimes I truly wish I was selfish enough to be thrilled about it. But I know Oakland, man. I know A's fans. I know I know how passionate Oakland fans are about the A's. And my heart breaks for them because I am one of them even though I'm here in Sacramento. The A's don't belong here. I'm happy they're here to some extent. And I'm hoping now that Oakland is essentially dead and gone, that the Las Vegas deal falls apart and the A's maybe can call Sacramento a permanent home. Or maybe this helps Sacramento get an MLB expansion team. Like, I understand the benefits for this city, short-term, long-term, economically. Like, I get it. But it doesn't erase the reality. And this is what I hope you understand. No matter how you feel about it, It does not erase the reality that Sacramento played a part in John Fisher screwing up or screwing Oakland, screwing A's fans, taking this team and trying to get them to Las Vegas. Right? The Kings, or sorry, Sacramento is simply a bridge. In my opinion, Sacramento is just a means to an end. Sacramento is getting used. Sacramento gave Fisher a golden option to step away from the negotiating table in Oakland as if he was even there in good faith to begin with. Still get his TV revenue, get ticket revenue from non-A's fans here in Sacramento who are going to show up not to support the A's and support Fisher, but to support baseball in in Sacramento and try and send a message to the MLB. He's going to benefit from all of this. And again, the only people that lose are diehard Oakland A's fans who have put up with being misrepresented and dragged through the mud for a very, very long time. I'm heartbroken by this. I truly am. To some extent, I grew up at Sutter Health Park, which I know is Rayleigh Field. It was Rayleigh Field forever. When they were the affiliate of the the, the Oakland A's, the AAA affiliate, I was there all the time growing up, watching some of my favorite Oakland A's of all time get their start in Sacramento with the Rivercats. So... I understand and I appreciate and love the Rivercats and baseball in Sacramento too. Oakland, The A's don't belong here. The A's don't belong anywhere but Oakland. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm those A's fans that might be listening. I sympathize for you as someone who is not saying that they understand when they really don't. Because most of these people that are saying, oh, I, under, I, I feel sorry for A's fans. I understand what they're going through. You have no freaking idea. You don't. Because most of you support a team that actually invests in their product. Or you claim to understand what they're going through and sympathize. But you always follow that up with a but. And then talk about how happy you are that they're in Sacramento or how Oakland didn't deserve them or Oakland screwed up the negotiations or Oakland is a dump anyway. The Coliseum is a dump. The crime rates in Oakland, all this crap that you follow up. I sympathize, but you don't. So don't pretend like you do. Just say you're happy that A's baseball is in Sacramento. Or better yet, say you don't care that the Oakland, the city of Oakland just lost their third and final professional sports franchise. Just, to, just say that. I'd rather you say that, even if it's more insulting, I'd rather you say that to my face, and I think A's fans would rather you say that to their face than you pretend to feel sorry for us or pretend to understand what we've experienced, not just during this relocation saga, but for the entire time that Fisher has called himself the owner of the A's. Slap in the face after slap in the face after slap in the face, and today is a day that Oakland fans have been dreading for a long, long time. Maybe a great day for the city of Sacramento. It's the worst day of some Oakland A's fans' lives. So I sympathize. I truly sympathize. I'm truly sorry. In many ways, I'm ashamed of Sacramento for being a part of this. Even if the benefits are there, even if I know what they're trying to accomplish, I know Sacramento's not getting nothing out of this. I'm not dumb. But I'm still ashamed of Sacramento playing a part in Fisher getting what he wants and Oakland fans losing their team, especially with what we went through here in Sacramento with the a, or with the Kings nearly going to Seattle. So took the opportunity to say my piece on that. I'm exhausted, man. This was a long freaking day. Hopefully the Kings can rally all of our spirits with a win, a, 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 a shocking win in Boston tomorrow. I, I'll be dead honest with you. I have no I don't have any positive expectations for tomorrow night's game. I don't. I expect to be hosting a Locked on Kings podcast where we're talking about back-to-back losses and potentially talking about the the Kings finding themselves by the end of the night in ninth place. Very good chance it happens tomorrow. I'm not trying to drag you down. I'm already in a bad mood because of everything that's happened over the last couple days, and I think I'm letting that seep into the podcast a little bit. I really could have used a Kings win tonight. I think all of us could have. But no matter what, Good mood, bad mood, mood positive, negative, win, loss, whatever the case may be. Of course, I'll always keep you uh, posted here and always uh, have this Locked on Kings podcast for you. I appreciate your support. Sorry to sound like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh today. Just kind of the way it is. But I appreciate you. Can't wait to have you join me on the next episode of Locked on Kings. Until then, my name is Matt George. You've been listening to the Locked on Kings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network.